Good morning and welcome. I'm Carol Plumley, a member of the Board of Trustees at the Unitarian Universal Church in Reston. We are so glad you are here with us this morning. It's a cold, wintry day in Reston. I hope you are all warm and comfortable where you are. No matter how old or how young you are, wherever you are in your spiritual journey, however you identify and whomever you love, know you are welcome here. Our service today is being led by Reverend Scott Alexander. We are also joined this morning by Linda Weaver, our Director of Religious Education, Cynthia Young, our Music Director, and Jesse Leon, our accompanist. Sterling Collette is serving as the Worship Associate, and Nani Mullen is a special guest participant in today's service. Ron Bracey, David Nemi, and Mike Schmidt are running the technical side of worship. Thank you all for participating in today's worship service. Please take some deep, quieting breaths with me. Let us enter our time of worship together as we listen to the beautiful and stirring civil rights anthem, We Shall Overcome, performed by Jesse Leon. While this song is usually labeled as traditional, meaning of unknown origins, it is thought to be based on a hymn by Charles Albert Tindley, an African-American Methodist minister and gospel music composer.
Welcome, dear friends, to our Martin Luther King uh, service in the year 2022, bending toward the bending the arc of the moral universe. Some of you may not know that this phrase, bending the arc of the moral universe, which uh, Martin Luther King made famous, actually originally came from the Reverend Theodore Parker, the great 19th century Unitarian minister who once wrote, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by experience of sight. But then he said, but I can divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I am sure it bends towards justice. And a century and a half later, Dr. Martin Luther King, having read Parker in his Boston Theological School, wrote, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. This is our focus today. And the opening words come from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who wrote, Justice for black people will not flow in society merely from court decisions, nor from mount fountains of political oratory, nor will a few token changes quell all the temptuous yearnings of millions of disadvantaged black people. White America must recognize that justice for black people cannot be achieved without radical changes in the structure of our society. The comfortable, the entrenched, the privileged cannot continue to tremble at the prospect of change in the status quo. And then he went on. When millions of people have been cheated for centuries, restitution, a key word today, restitution is a costly process. Inferior education, poor housing, unemployment, inadequate health care, each is a bitter component of the oppression that has been our heritage. Each will require billions of dollars to correct. And then he went on, justice so long deferred has accumulated interest and its cost for this society will be substantial in financial as well as human terms. And then he ends, this fact has not yet been fully grasped because most of the gains of the past decades were obtained at bargain rates. The desegregation of public facilities costs nothing. Neither did the election and appointments of a few black officials. True restitution is a long and costly process. Let us join in our opening hymn. If you're at home, the words will be in the chat. Gather the Spirit, a beautiful hymn. Join with Cynthia and Jesse. Cynthia. Good morning. As Reverend Scott just said, we invite you now to join us in singing our opening hymn, which is hymn number 347, Gather the Spirit. The words will appear in your chat box, so we hope that you will sing along with me and Jesse. Unite them. 
Good morning. I'm Sterling Paulette. Welcome to our church. The chalice lighting reading also comes to us from the writings of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Violence merely increases hate. Returning violence for violence only multiplies violence adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. In our church, we have a tradition of recommitting to each other every Sunday by singing our covenant together. Love is the spirit of this church. We will sing along with our congregation and choir virtual video. The words are in the video itself. If you are visiting us this morning for the first time, we hope you will accept this song as our blessing to you. So now is the time in our service when we share our joys and concerns so that no one in our community has to ever share them alone. Uh, if you are joining us remotely this morning, you may wish to light a real or virtual candle wherever you are to mark what is on your heart. And I will be lighting the candles here in the sanctuary in symbolic uh, unity with all of yours. Um, if you would like to share something in the congregational chat this morning on the screen to let others know what's on your heart, please write something to all attendees. And remember, please, that what you write will be public. And read those joys and concerns from one another and enter into your own time of reflection and prayer as we listen now to Jesse playing our meditation music. <laughs> Thank you. 
Let us join in a spirit of prayer and oneness. Spirit of life and love that animates our creation, we are grateful for this community which is so faithfully with us in both times of joy and sorrow. We especially hold in our hearts this morning all who are ill around our country, grieving, facing illness or disability, either themselves or in a loved one or a friend. Whether shared here this morning or held silently in our hearts, may our joys be multiplied in our concern and care for one another. And may all here this morning find comfort and calm. Amen. So this morning when I turned off of Wheelie Avenue, the two new banners were up expressing our inclusiveness. And here to talk about why we are doing this is Nani Mullen, Racial Justice Committee Chair on this MLK Sunday. Good morning, and yes, there were many people involved. Um, so for several years, this church has proudly displayed the Black Lives Matter banner and the LGBTQ flag um, at the entrance of our property. And um, we display these symbols as a physical manifestation and a reminder of our spiritual commitment to the causes of racial equity and inclusiveness of all of people of all identities and sexualities. Um, but yes, that when it comes to actually physically getting out there, um, the Chris uh, Topolewski and Terry Grogan, I believe, were braving the cold yesterday and physically put it up. Um, so very thankful for that. Um, these values come right out of our foundational UU principles. Um, the UU General Assembly in 2015 adopted an action of immediate witness in, in support of the movement for black lives and a 2021 action of immediate witness was titled Defend and Advocate with Transgender, Non-Binary, and Intersex Communities. Um, and there have been many other similar U policy statements and programs um, to support these goals. Um, unfortunately, but not surprisingly, um, there have been repeated acts of vandalism um, against the banners and the flag. Uh, this has happened to other houses of worship um, throughout the country. And uh, so you may have noticed that the banner and flag were missing for the past um, several months. Um, and so I am happy to report that yes, as of yesterday, they have been reinstalled to the rightful places so that everyone passing by may see. Um, and oh, oh, thank you, Mike. You can see the, the photos. Um, we will not stop with this one-time act of love and recommitment. Um, we are committed to telling the community that we stand for these values and that will not be deterred by vandalism. Um, the SOAC Just Committee has committed to replacing the flag and banner as needed in the future. Um, and then we've also started to think more about uh, permanent signage uh, and that's maybe a little bit hard to abscond with. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the racial justice and LGBTQ teams plan to continue reaching out um, to impacted communities and build relationships with um, allies in church, other local churches, and in the community to see what concrete actions we can take together to make more progress. We will not be deterred, but instead we will use this opportunity to redouble our efforts and commitments. Yeah. We now invite you to support the work of UU Reston by making your donation to our collection plate at the link on the slide and in the chat box. Thank you for your generosity and support of our beloved spiritual home.
Our special music today is a gift from Leah Morris, a singer songwriter and fabulous all around musician who lives and works right here in our local DC region. Leah has been so generous sharing her artistry with the UU community over these last months. In this performance, she offers her own creative interpretation of the traditional spiritual, my Lord, what a morning. The content of this morning's reading before the sermon may be familiar to many of you. It comes from a compelling essay focusing primarily on the centuries of systematic economic uh, injustice perpetrated upon African Americans flowing directly out of the heinous 
institution of slavery that has, as you know, been one of the most defining realities of American life. This essay, a collection of essays writ, uh, uh, gathered by Nicole Hannah-Jones. It comes from the lead essay of the New York Times monumental educational effort in uh, 19, do, entitled The 1619 Project, which summarized, as I'm sure many of you know, all of the many significant and painful ways in which the legacy of American slavery, which began 400 years ago, perpetrated after the Civil War by subsequent generations of cultural and institutional Jim Crow racism, have fundamentally shaped our society to this day, including and not limited to the profound wealth inequality that exists between white and black Americans. Here are the words and analysis of Ms. Hannah Jones, which I believe form the basis of, a, of serious, for serious moral consideration of my focus this morning, the controversial idea still of establishing government financed reparations to correct the injustices of historic racism directed at African Americans. One, prop, one practical model I will seek to spell out shortly, but here is the reading. Ms. Hannah Jones in her lead essay. During the world's heinous slavery period in the 17th and 18th century, 12 and a half million Africans were kidnapped from their homes and brought in chains across the Atlantic Ocean in the largest forced immigration of human history. While most of these enslaved Americans, and many of you may not know this, were transported to cruel servitude in the Caribbean and South America, approximately only 400,000 men, women, and children were sold in America. Those individuals transformed the land to which they had been brought and their ancestors. Through backbreaking labor, they cleared the land across the southeast. They taught the colonists how to grow rice. They grew and picked the cotton that was the nation's most valuable commodity. They built grand plantations. They laid the foundations of the White House and the Capitol building. They lugged the heavy wooden tracks of the railroads that crisscrossed the South that helped take the cotton they pick to the northern textile mills, fueling the American Industrial Revolution. They built vast fortunes for white people, North and South. Profits from black people's stolen labor helped the young nation pay off its war debts and finance some of its most prestigious universities. It was the relentless buying, selling, insuring, and financing of their bodies and the products of their labor, Hannah Jones points out, that made Wall Street, with its thriving banking, insurance, and trading, the financial capital of the world. And then Hannah Jones goes on to describe how the legacy of economic injustice and inequality continues to this day, even though the heinous institution of slavery was formally abolished in 1865 with the Emancipation Proclamation. She writes, the economic injustice of American slavery and the generations of institutional racism that followed to this, is to this day reflected in the vast wealth inequality that exists between white and black Americans. Despite the fact that black Americans have undeniably all out of proportion to their numbers contributed mightily for 400 years to our economic success as Americans, and now th this chart. Today, the average white household possesses $171,000 of assets, while the average black household has only 17,000 of assets. In other words, today's black Americans, in terms of wealth, have only one-tenth of what whites do. And then she concludes, the, this yawning and unjust gap in wealth can be directly traced back at every stage of American economic development to the unjust and exploitive ways African Americans have been treated as workers and citizens, beginning, of course, with 250 years of totally enslaving poverty, systematic economic racism, which has not been remedied in the generations since slavery was abolished. Here ends 
the morning reading. So I want to begin this morning with a bit of a confession, which may strike a personal resonance with many of you as well. Despite the fact that my topic this morning, the moral proposal, that there should be some significant form of federal, governmental, financial reparations made to African Americans in direct compensation for the terrible economic legacy of slavery and the subsequent injustices of American systematic racism. But despite the fact this has been widely discussed in national circles for at least a generation, I will admit that until very recently, I personally never really gave it much serious moral or intellectual consideration until the New York Times published this groundbreaking uh, work, the 1619 Project. There's now a new version, book of it, book version of it. Take a look at it if you're not really familiar with it. That began to truly investigate and seriously reflect upon what it might mean for our nation collectively to consider taking the bold financial steps that would be required to at least partially repair the terrible tear in our national soul which the economic injustice of slavery and generations of subsequent anti-black racism have so visibly caused. Up until recently, I, as apparently a majority of white Americans, some 85%, according to a recent poll, are not convinced that America should pay actual financial reparations to its African American citizenry. This week, you all received from us in your Reston email announcing this service a document which presents, I think, in as neutral a fair way as I can, the arguments both pro and con which uh, for reparations in our national debate. And if you d can't find that document, um, write us email and we'll send it again, but it, it uh, should be, it will be uh, available to you. Until I personally dug a little deeper into this intensifying national issue, I simply was not sufficiently persuaded that our nation could or maybe even should engage in what and may will be a very, very costly economic and social undertaking. But I am now persuaded that financial reparations of some significant form or another, uh, and there needs to be a detailed conversation about precisely how to make this happen, are not only morally necessary, but also economically feasible. It would be my hope that as a result of our explored uh, topic, uh, explored exploration of this topic this morning, that many of you in the Reston area will, will be persuaded to become advocates with your friends and family and government officials for such direct repar uh, reparations. So let me begin this MLK conversation with what I think is the easy and indisputable, albeit terribly painful part, namely, the overwhelming truth that the heinous institution of slavery, followed by uninterrupted generations of other sinister iterations and mechanisms of personal and institutional racism, have caused immeasurable and direct harm to the economic well-being and opportunity for wealth accumulation and financial security for most of our African, much of our African American population. In this morning's reading before the sermon, Nicole Hannah-Jones laid out just the heartbreaking outlines of how the injustices of enslavement and anti-black racism systematically operated to impoverished generations of African Americans, leading to the vast disparity, one to 10, in actual wealth in households in America. The more elusive piece of this, which I believe is the most important for 21st century white Americans to understand, is that the undeniable fact that much, if not most, of the economic harm done to African Americans has systematically occurred after slavery was abolished. You hear people in the culture saying, well, we abolished slavery in 1865. What's the problem? We've been working on this for a long time. It happened after slavery 
after the close of the Civil War. Any legitimate social or economic historian will tell you the abolishment of slavery did little to end the systematic injustice and oppression directed at black folks. Yes, there was, at the conclusion of the Civil War, one bold, might even call it radical, attempt to provide real economic reparations for the freed slaves. In 1865, the federal government, many of you know this, following General Sherman's military order of the same name, largely made good on its promise for, quote, 40 acres and a mule. President Lincoln and the Congress indeed did re redistribute a huge tract of the southern Atlantic coastline, some 400,000 acres in North and South Carolina mostly, and Georgia, of largely abandoned rice fields to black Americans just freed from slavery. But just one year later, President Andrew Jackson, a rabid racist and supporter of the Confederacy, largely undid this positive and effective land program with the stroke of a pen, returning most of the land to its previous slaveholder owners. And as any American history buff knows, in the dark and brutal decades that were to follow, most particularly across the South, systematic discriminatory Jim Crow laws and practices, including the nearly total abrogation of voting and legal rights, educational inequality, residential segregation, and the murderous violence of the KKK, conspired to keep many of the brutal social and economic dynamics which uh, ensured the impoverishment and disempowerment, including uh, sharecropping of black citizens. And then in the 20th century, as educational and, resi and residential segregation was partially addressed, and some civil and voting rights were partially protected, many African Americans were nonetheless systematically excluded from home ownership and its powerful potential for wealth accumulation. Most, most Americans, their wealth is connected to home ownership. And they, this was done by the surreptitious racist policies and discriminatory practices of banks, insurance companies, realtors, mortgage lenders, and federal housing policies and procedures, including the systematic discriminatory practice of banks and mortgage companies of redlining America, African American neighborhoods, making it poss impossible to get loans in these neighborhoods. Much of this history of 20th century American racial in economic inequality, this largely hidden structural system of ongoing race-based discrimination and inequality is readily available for any American who wants to educate themselves. And I must say it right here and right now, in the year 2022, there is no excuse for any American, most especially white Americans, not to understand and not to fully accept the stark, unavoidable truth of how both slavery and anti-black racism created and continue to create vast economic disparity and injustice for African American families and individuals. Now let me stop right here and ask something challenging of each and every one of you. I believe that primarily the, the, the primary reason so many white Americans do not currently support the idea of direct financial rep, uh, reparations to African Americans, again, 85% according to the surveys, is that they do not yet fully understand or appreciate or grasp how institutional anti-black racism as opposed to personal prejudice, most specifically the mechanisms of discrimination in federal housing programs in the bank and the banking and mortgage and insurance industries uh, and in the electoral, educational and criminal justice systems has over recent decades systematically conspired to rob African Americans of the opportunity to uh, accrue personal property, and wealth. 
when this or the general subject of poverty in America comes up in conversation with your family and friends and co-workers, please speak up. Share your knowledge. Refer them to the 1619 Project and about the subtle, pernicious mechanisms that have prevented equality for all. As Unitarian Universalists, let us all do our part in raising awareness about the powerful and largely hidden and pernicious forces of institutional racism. Please be a clear moral voice in our community and culture for helping us all to face in honest and concrete terms this unacceptable inequality and injustice. All right, optimist that I am, I will assume in this progressive, thoughtful, and educated congregation that I need spend no more time persuading any of you uh, something every American ought to understand, that slavery and anti-black racism and institutional racism has profoundly damaged the social and economic lives of our African American neighbors and friends. Again, as I said at the outset of my address this morning, I believe that it is a moral imperative, morally imperative, that, in, that our culture, through the vehicle of federal tax dollars, makes a sincere and substantial effort to partially remediate this terrible economic injustice. So, optimistically assuming, with our help, a plurality of Americans can relatively soon be persuaded that financial reparations to our African American population is both right and necessary. The twofold question becomes what I've projected up. First, realistically, how much can our national economy afford to invest in reparations? for our African American population without endangering the prosperity for everyone? And secondly, what reparation modalities, mechanisms, programs will be effective and reasonable to accomplish this moral goal? Let me begin with the first question first. To what extent can the economy and the federal budget realistically afford to invest in such reparations? One eye-popping analysis found in a recent Harper's article estimates that total fair reparations due our African American population for forced labor extracted between 1619 and 1865 is approximately, are you ready for this? $97 trillion, which is more than 56 times the current annual budget of the, our entire federal government, a big bill. So it is obvious to me that any federal reparations effort can only be partial in scope and can probably only be achieved over a sustained period of time with our government steadily investing money in this effort for generations to come. Now, before we go any further, Something positive must be acknowledged and affirmed as we begin this conversation about a new systematic federal reparations effort. And it is ironically a point made in the list of arguments against any such effort in that pro-con document I sent all of you earlier this week. The third bullet against reparations states, Federal and state governments have already spent billions of dollars on social programs such as welfare, subsidized housing, health care, employment development, affirmative action, and education. I indeed hope that as an adjunct part of any new reparations effort that our federal government would continue to significantly fund all of these programs and other anti-poverty efforts, which assist not only impoverished blacks, but the vast number of impoverished whites. Just go to rural Tennessee, folks, if you want to see white impoverishment. But that social justice effort, exclusive of the larger and urgent question as to whether or not our American economy can now afford significant additional investment to address this issue of reparations. And I would suggest not only it can, it must. 
So, what I'm about to offer you now, and the numbers may make your head spin, hang with me, folks. Uh, put on your little thinking caps. I want to propose one very specific, particular, concrete reparations proposal that I have created. Uh, that being a well-funded U.S. federal reparations housing trust fund for your consideration. Now, please understand that I understand there are many other potential uh, methods and modalities we might use to approach reparations and to bring greater economic and social justice for all. Um, but in spite of the fact that there are many other valid ways of doing this, I want to suggest this one proposal for your consideration. I believe that one affordable, manageable, and potentially very effective national reparations program would be this Federal Reparations Housing Trust Fund. And without going into an impossible level of detail and making your head spin with math, here is how I envision it working. As I shared a bit earlier, the wealth gap between white and black Americans' households is something on a scale of 1 to 10. And in this morning's reading before the sermon, uh, while most white households uh, achieve about 100, have about 171,000 of assets, the average African-American family has a mere 17,000. Uh, a gap because of the discriminatory factors we mentioned about 20th century American uh, housing life. And they've been ex excludedly, systematically excluded from financial rewards of home ownership, which as you all know is the greatest single pathway to wealth in America. There are now 45 million African Americans living in the United States out of a population of 335 million. So that's approximately 10 million African American households. Although I could find no statistics on this, I will assume that a significant number of these households, let's say half, 5 million of them, because they are lower income and lack the liquid wealth usually required for a home purchase, I'm assuming half of African American households are not able to make a down payment and are forced to then pay rent uh, month, month to month, and thus are denied the opportunity to create that wealth investment, the wealth uh, building of wealth asset that comes with home ownership. So, the Federal Reparations Housing Trust Fund I envision would be a fund of many billions of dollars, and more on the total amount later, that would loan interest-free in the form of a federally-backed 20-year mortgage the full purchase price of individual homes for African-American families. Full purchase price. Such a program would allow working American, African-American families to begin accruing that wealth that creates the American dream. So how many billions would be required to get this program, such a program, underway? Well, look at my ballpark math now, and please, again, don't get uh, hung up in the details. All this can be, um, can be um, um, worked with. My figuring, if half, five million, African-American households qualify for the program, and if 150000 is a reasonable average uh, purchase price for a starter home, a trust fund then of $750 billion would enable full and immediate participation by all qualifying African-American households. With 20-year mortgages, one-twentieth of the loan amount would be returned to the trust fund every year as the program participants made their monthly mortgage payments back to the government, providing continuing trust funds then for new families, younger families, as they enter into the program. But the question uh, quickly becomes then, will the American economy and will chronically reluctant American taxpayers Realistically, can they be asked to support so vast a number, $750 billion? The answer is probably no. And here's why. 
Currently, the entire U.S. federal budget is $1.4 trillion, which is $1,400 billion. This would mean that a fully funded federal reparations trust fund, $750 billion, would add about 50% to total federal spending, a cost which would need to be covered either by wildly increasing taxes on some or all Americans, look out rich boys, or radically increasing the national debt, neither of which, I think, is likely to be politically or economically sustainable. So, my last bullet point, what might be a realistic starting number for our nation to invest in such a housing reparation fund? Well, that is a question that might have many different answers depending on one's fiscal or social perspectives. But to begin the discussion, I will tell you, if you don't already know it, that as a nation, we Americans invest tax dollars and overspend increasing our national debt many billions of dollars for things we say we care about. Just one figure for your consideration. Over the last decade, our government leaders, our presidents and Congress, while both claiming to believe in fiscal responsibility, have allowed the national debt to increase by $9 trillion, reaching this year a new all-time high of $26 trillion. Seeing that the massive financial outlay was, that that massive financial outlay was acceptable for both our political leaders and voting population, and it, it happened without a lot of national pain or outrage, let's start with the relatively modest figure of $120 billion, the cost, get this, of just three brand new naval aircraft carriers or just 125 of the new F-35 fighter jets. Let's just begin with that one little tiny piece of the military budget as a possible starting place for funding the Home Reparation Trust Fund. Half of that amount, $60 billion, could be raised by modestly increasing taxes on the Leon Musks and all the, you know, all the very rich people um, in America, so-called billionaires, and the other half by increasing the national debt as we have been doing. So, an initial federal housing reparations trust fund of $120 billion would, would fund no down payment, interest-free loans for more than 750,000 African-American households, about 18% of the total estimated uh, 5 million households that would potentially qualify and need such support to buy their first homes. This would get a substantial number of African-American households on the road to real wealth and security. When I shared this concrete reparations proposal with some savvy uh, financial accountant friends of mine, they enthusiastically pointed out to me, more than one of them did, that such a program would also immediately and substantially benefit the overall U.S. national economy in the following ways. A $120 billion reparations housing fund would encourage full employment and active participation in the economy by more African Americans promised with the ability to have a home, they would, they would uh, go to work. Create a massive infusion of new capital and activity in the whole economy. Homes would be fixed up, appliances purchased, uh, repair um, uh, men and women would be, contractors would be busy. This would significantly also increase both federal and local tax dollars. Uh, houses would be put back in the tax base, causing a massive expansion in the home building, materials, and renovation industries. Places like Detroit, where there are thousands of burned out homes and run down homes, could be revitalized, uh, stimulating the economy all over the country. So, I realize this is kind of a... Uh, uh, you know, number crunching kind of sermon this morning, but you guys are smart enough to figure it out. 
On this Martin Luther King Sunday, I have proposed a very specific initial reparations program to begin addressing centuries of economic injustice perpetrated on our African-American citizenry tied directly to the all-important benefit of home ownership. As I have said at the outset, I believe that reparations are an urgent moral necessity for our nation. Given the centuries of powerful institutional and personal racism that has caused so much economic inequality and injustice. As many uh, commentators have observed, racism is the shameful original sin of American life. We have to wash that sin right out of our hair, and we got to spend money and effort doing it. Whether or not my specific reparations housing trust fund proposal or some other serious re re remediation program is adopted, again, as I've already said, it is my sincere hope that an array of other federal programs designed to address generational poverty for blacks and whites and Latinos and everybody else will continue to win the support of the American people. Together as a principled nation, we simply must find practical and honorable ways to rectify centuries of heinous injustice and inequality. I have every confidence that there is room, both in the American heart and in the federal budget, for concrete, substantial reparations for our African-American neighbors and friends. We can afford what we care about. We can afford what is morally necessary. As Unitarian Universalists committed to social and economic justice, let's do everything we can to make this happen in America right now. Not another generation go by. Amen. Our closing hymn. Our closing hymn today is number 1018 in your teal hymnal, Come and Go With Me. The words will appear in your chat box, so we hope you will sing along with me and Jesse. Thank you.
Cynthia, you can't see it, but the few people here were dancing. <laughs> I send you on your way with these words from Martin Luther King, Jr. We are in a beautiful struggle for a new world. Now let us rededicate ourselves to the long and bitter but beautiful struggle for a new world. Shall we say the odds are too great? Shall we tell our sisters and brothers the struggle is too hard? Will our message be that forces of American life mitigate against their arrival as full persons and we send our deepest regrets? Or will there be another message of longing, of hope, of solidarity with their yearnings, of commitment to their cause, whatever the cost? The choice is ours, and though we may prefer it otherwise, we must choose it in this crucial moment of human history. Go in peace this Sunday and unrest. Peace and unrest. Amen. Thank you to our friends at our neighboring UU Church in Fairfax, Laura Weiss, and her special ensemble of musicians and singers for offering us our postlude today. We're going to enjoy a beautiful version of hymn number 1014, Answering the Call of Love, shared with us by Laura and the musicians of UUCF. You can sing along as the words will be in the video. Let's all join in and be inspired by answering the call of love.
We invite our congregants to join us on Zoom for our virtual Greet Your Neighbor Coffee Hour today to discuss the service theme and enjoy fellowship with other congregants. The link is in the chat box and on the upcoming slide. Also, please use that chat box as a virtual receiving line to leave a message about your appreciation for the worship service. Have a nice rest of your day, and in your life, carpe diem, seize the day. <laughs>